against the world, Enoch and Noah. We've been going through the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. I believe it was Paul who wrote the letter. That's a minority opinion now, but highly debated. But the author was writing to the Hebrew Christians in the early church, and he was showing them something, and he was warning them about something. He was showing them how Jesus is better. Jesus is far superior to any of the types and shadows in the old covenant system that were supposed to point to Jesus. Jesus obviously is better than those types that were pointing to Jesus. And he was warning them that if they, had, if they abandoned Christ and returned to the old covenant system, if they apostatized, there would be no hope for them. So in, in chapter 10, there was a strong warning about falling away. Very strong warning. And he knew they were going, they were already being Christian or persecuted for being Christians, and they were being tempted to, to, to go back to the, the, the old system and, and abandon Christ, to leave Christ. And there was much persecution of, ahead. And so the author of Hebrews is writing in Hebrews 11 and, and giving them this, all these stories from the Old Testament of faith. He knows they're going to need faith. He knows there's hard times ahead, and they're going to need to be faithful in those hard times. Before I begin, though, I want to clarify something that we talked about last Lord's Day. Uh, Steve actually t brought this up to me after the service, and I think he made a good point. Uh, uh, I talked about something that I learned from Sproul, uh, that Sproul learned from the Protestants in the Reformation. So we talked last week about uh, three elements involved in faith, or three elements of, of saving faith. And the first, and the, I use Latin words, Sproul used the Latin words. First was notitia, second was ascensus, and third, fiducia. There's a Latin teacher here now. I'm a little nervous that I'm not saying it right. So notitia is just the data. The, uh, the, that refers to the content of faith, the information, right? That's the information, that which is believed. And the second is ascensus, where we get the word ascent, uh, a census is our conviction that the content of our faith, it's, it, the content is true. It's that conviction that, that the content of our faith is true. It's the intellectual assent to the truth of the data. You can know about the person and work of Christ and the gospel message and still not believe it. And third is fiducia or trust. This refers to personal trust and reliance. And I think that if we're going to talk about saving faith, we need to start with fiducia. That's where it begins. That's the actual saving faith. The other, the other ones uh, follow. Fiducia comes first as a gift from God, and then comes the intellectual aspects of faith, the data and the ascent. So uh, the intellectual aspects of faith are not... I would, I would change what I said last week a little bit and say that the, the intellectual aspects of faith are not ingredients of saving faith, but the results of saving faith, the result of saving faith. Paul in Ephesians 2 says that it is by grace that you've been saved through faith, and this, meaning the faith, this is not your own doing, it's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Saving faith is not a result of data or assent or works, it's just the gift of God. It's the gift of God. This is why I believe that even infants, even in the womb, can be given the gift of faith. What happened when Elizabeth, pregnant with John, and Mary, pregnant with Jesus, what happened when they got together? Luke 1, 41, it says, And when, the, when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And in case you think that it was just a coincidence, uh, and the baby just happened to be kicking or moving, uh, Elizabeth, in verse 44, clears away all the doubt as to what was really happening. It says in verse 44, Elizabeth says to Mary, For behold, when the, second, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Leaped for joy. The unborn baby John didn't just leap, he leaped for joy. It wasn't a coincidence, it was an act of worship. It wasn't just a fluke, it was faith. The concept of faith in the womb isn't new, 
uh, to the New Testament either. In Psalm 22, verse 9, David says, Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breasts. On you was I cast from birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. From his mother's womb, God had been his God. I think David would have agreed with the Apostle Paul that he was saved by faith alone and that faith was not his own doing. It was the gift of God, not a result of works, so that he couldn't boast. Psalm 71, 5 and 6 says, For you, O Lord, are my hope, my fiducia. O Yahweh, from my youth upon you I have leaned from before my birth. I have leaned from before my birth. You are he who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. There's a lot more scriptures, a lot more scriptures on uh, this this topic of pedo faith. There's a book uh, by Rich Lusk, if you want to look into it deeper, called Pedo Faith. My main point is I just wanted to clear up from last week that fiducia, trust, comes first. It's the gift of God and the intellectual aspects of faith Noticia and Ascensus come later. And I think uh, it would be more accurate to call Fiducia saving faith, and the other two are what follows. So if I lost you there, sorry. I just wanted to clear that up by making it more confusing. Um, I want to begin today by giving a quick little history lesson about the early church father named Athanasius of Alexandria. He was a a man of faith and bravery who would not back down from the intimidating pressure of the majority opinion. He had the courage to not cave in to the crowds. They tried to cancel him, but truth triumphed. In order to understand what made the ministry of Athanasius so critical in the history of the church, we have to know what was happening in the world at his time. It was back in the 4th century when the Christian church was still in its infancy. Athanasius was born around the year 298 in Alexandria, Egypt. As a young man, he received a great education, mainly uh, theological, and was ordained as a deacon. Throughout his life, he would go on to become one of the greatest theologians and defenders of the Christian faith. The early 4th century was a period of uh, uh, much trouble in the church. Turbulence. Uh, a priest named Arius started spreading a doctrine which we know we know now as Arianism. Now, not not the uh, Arianism with a Y, you know, the Nazi thing. It's Ar- named after Arius, Arianism. According to uh, this doctrine, Jesus was not equal to God the Father in essence, but was instead a created being. Jesus was a created being. Arius taught that. He was a great, uh, greater than all other beings. He was created first, even before the angels, but he was created by God, and then God uh, allowed him to create everything else. Arius believed that he was the greatest of God's creatures. He emphasized the transcendence of the Father, but denied his eminence. He, he emphasized the otherness of God, but denied that God would get involved in creation. Arius taught... Uh, Homoousios was the word that Jesus was of like or similar in essence with his father. Jesus was the first being, uh, the first being the father created and the most important being, uh, and then Jesus, the Logos, created everything else. Athanasius, who later became the bishop of Alexandria, found himself at the center. He was at the middle of this theological battle. He believed and defended the truth that Christ is of the same substance as the Father, and that he is both fully divine and fully human. Athanasius stood for homoousios, which is, there's uh, one letter missing there, uh, iota? Yeah. But was of the very, he was of the very being of the Father. Not, he wasn't similar to the Father, he was of the very being and essence of the Father. He was not brought into existence with similar being, but was eternally one with the divine being. So this, this, this whole controversy uh, culminated with Athanasius defending his stance at the First Council of Nicaea in 325, 
which ultimately resulted in the Nicene Creed, the, the confession of faith that we just uh, said together. Every, we do it every Lord's Day. It was because of the heresy of Arius that the Nicene Creed includes phrases like very God of very God, begotten, not made. Arius was saying begotten. He was using that language to sh- say, well, see, he was, he was created. He's begotten. So they added that in there for that very reason. Begotten, not made. Being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made. Arius used the word begotten to prove his heresy that Jesus was created. So in the years following uh, the Council of Nicaea, Arianism continued to gain popularity, especially among political authorities. Athanasius found himself often standing against emperors, bishops, other influential figures who sought to promote Arianism or compromise the faith. Athanasius was exiled five times by various Roman emperors, four of which were for his defense of the deity of Christ against Arianism. Seventeen of his 45 years as bishop were spent in exile. He experienced a lot of persecution, false accusations for fighting for the truth of the deity of Christ. And because of his faithfulness in the midst of trials and overwhelming opposition against him, there's a phrase that's been attached to him ever since, and it's Athanasius Contramundum, which means Athanasius against the world. Athanasius against, did I say that wrong too? Oh. I didn't know he was going to be here. I wouldn't have used any Latin phrases. Um. What was I saying? Athanasius against the world. And that really does capture the essence of the life and ministry of Athanasius. He stood firm in his faith against seemingly insurmountable odds. Now, we all know that this is often the case in history. The majority has frequently been on the wrong side of the truth. Something is not true or false based on the subjective number of people who believe it. Jesus made this clear when he said this in Matthew 7. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Martin Luther famously said, one with God is a majority. I love this old quote from Samuel Adams, the man, not the beer. He said this, It does not take a majority to prevail, but rather an irate, tireless minority keen on setting brush fires of freedom in the minds of men. So this brings me back to our text in the Hall of Faith chapter, Hebrews chapter 11. We're looking at the heroes of the faith in the Old Testament. Last week we looked at Abel. Uh, Today and the next Lord's Day, we're going to look at Enoch and Noah. I wanted to make this a two-part sermon because next Sunday is Father's Day. And uh, and this is a good story for Father's Day, so I stretched it out a little bit. Ties into Father's Day rather nicely. We've only made it four verses into chapter 11, so I just want to first read those verses as by way of review, refresh our memories, and then we'll move on. Hebrews 11, 1 through 4 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of the things that are visible. By faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his, and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. Now we get to Enoch in the next verses, and then Noah. So let's read that. Hebrews 11, verse 5. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found, because God had taken him. Now before he was taken... He was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists 
and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Enoch's example of faith is one that illustrates the impact that one man can have on future generations. And that's why his story and Noah's story are perfect for Father's Day. Uh, our text doesn't say much about Enoch. It doesn't say a whole lot. It's kind of mysterious. If this was all that we had to his story, it would, it would be even more uh, mysterious. In fact, listen to verse 5 again. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. He was taken up so that he won't see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. What in the world is that all about? What does it mean that, uh, what does that have to do with faith? Thankfully, we get more clues in a few other passages in Scripture. We should first go back to his actual story, way back in Genesis 5. In Genesis, we read about the genealogy of Adam down to Noah, it's, it's a description of the descendants of Adam through the line of Seth. And Noah is here today, even. Um, so, in the previous chapter, uh, Genesis 5, we see how bad things, or Genesis 4, we see how bad things have become through the lineage of Cain, who killed his brother Abel. And the last two verses of chapter 4 end with these words, and Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of Yahweh. So there's a little bit of hope now. The world was dark. It was getting bad, uh, worse and worse. But through this line of Seth, People began to call on the name of Yahweh. Worship was being restored. And notice Seth is shown as kind of a substitute. It says, she bore a son and called his name Seth, for she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel. So there's a substitution idea right there in the text, just as there was with Abel, the story of Abel. So there's a hint of hope through the line of Seth, and that's what we read about in chapter 5 of Genesis. Again, chapter 5 gives us the, the descendants of Adam through the lineage of Seth. And down in verse 21, we read about Enoch. So here's what it says, Genesis 5, 21 through 24. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. The mystery continues. Who's this guy, and what happened to him? Now, in the text, in Genesis 5, when you're reading the whole chapter, there's a sudden change of flow and rhythm when we get to Enoch. Uh, verse 5 says, Thus all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Verse 8, Thus all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. Verse 11, Thus all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. Verse 14, Thus all the days of Kenan were 910 years, and he died. Verse 17, Thus all the days of Mahalalel were 895 years, and he died. Continues to say, and he died, and he died, and he died. And then there's the beginning of a transition in the next few verses. Verse 18, it says, When Jared had lived 162 years, he fathered Enoch. Jared lived after he fathered Enoch 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. So Enoch's dad, Jared, lived 962 years, and he died. But now when we get to Enoch, something different happens. He lived 65 years. He fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. 
Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for, he, for God took him. So, and he died, and he died, and he died, and all of a sudden, Enoch was just not. God took him. Enoch didn't die. The phrase, and he died, is used over and over until we get to Enoch. And I think that that phrase, and he died, and he died, is pointing us back to the fall. And Enoch, for a moment in history, breaks this pattern of death. And Enoch becomes the father of Methuselah. And I like what John MacArthur says about uh, him naming Methuselah, Methuselah. He says, Methuselah is a word that means or a name that means the man of sending forth, or the man of the spear, or the man of the javelin. Something shot out. He was a God-named prophecy. Methuselah was a God-named prophecy. In other words, his name, his very name was a prophecy of what what was coming. His name means that he would not die until the judgment was sent forth, until judgment came. He would not die. He is the man that is linked with the judgment. Divine judgment would not come until Methuselah died. So the demonstration of God's mercy is he lived longer than any other person in history, 969 years. So the fact that he lived so long is showing the mercy of God because judgment was coming on the world as soon as Methuselah died. MacArthur continues, so for... For 600, or 969 years, until Methuselah died, the world of people was being warned that, that judgment was coming. The year Methuselah died, down in verse 27 of Genesis 5, says, and he died, the flood shot forth and drowned the world. God let him live longer than anybody else. Grace was extended in the face of judgment, and when he died, the flood came. That's MacArthur. But notice what it says about Enoch, not just once, but twice. It says, he walked with God. He walked with God. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah. And then it says, Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. It wasn't just that he walked with God, but he faithfully walked with God for another 300 years after he had Methuselah. When you think of the world that he lived in, that's really an amazing thought. He lived in a world that was getting worse and worse and worse, and he lived for 300 years after Methuselah was born, and he stayed faithful. He walked with God. Remember, the flood was coming. The flood that drowned the whole world was coming. But in spite of a world gradually, more and more, abandoning God, Enoch walked with God. Our text in Hebrews says, now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And then it says in our text in Hebrews that the only way we can please God is by faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So I, th- I think the fact that Noah pleased God and faithfully walked with God are basically saying the same thing. In fact, the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament in Genesis 5, where it says he walked with God, the Greek translation is he was pleasing to God. So it's the same thing. He walked with God. He was pleasing to God. We need to remember uh, what happened in the garden with Adam and Eve before the fall What were they doing? They were walking with God and fellowshipping with God, communing with God. It was only after they sinned, it says in Genesis 3, 8, when they heard the sound of Yahweh God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Yahweh God among the trees of the garden. Sin caused them to stop walking from God. Sin caused them to hide from God. It's our sin, it's in our sin that we no longer seek God, we hide from God. Paul in Romans 3 describes man in his state of sin like this, none is righteous, no, not one, no one understands, no one seeks for God, all have turned aside, together they have become worthless, no one does good, not even one. Now with Enoch, walking with God was being restored. 
this, this concept, this idea, this, this action of walking with God was being restored and made possible again. Enoch was, was recovering what Adam and Eve lost. In a world that was in a downward spiral of falling farther and farther away from God, Enoch was faithfully walking with God, pleasing God. The communion that Adam and Eve lost with God was being restored with Enoch. Enoch's faith that, that, uh, Enoch's faith that, that God existed and that God was a rewarder of those who seek him allowed him to bypass death and walk with God right back into the garden, right, right back into the garden paradise. He's an illustration of the fact that the only way to walk with God, the only way to please God is by putting your trust in him, believing in the fact that God is good and that he rewards those who seek him. Believing that God is God and that God is good. He was a God who rewards those who seek him. Psalm 70 verse 4 says, May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say evermore, God is great. Enoch didn't believe in a God, a deistic God, who created the world like a clockmaker that wound it up and then just took off, left it ticking on its own like some absentee landlord. He believed that God was intimately involved and rewarded those who seek him. He sought the reward of righteousness and holiness and forgiveness that only God can give. He walked with God. He walked by faith. And the fact that he walked with God means there was reconciliation. There was restoration because we're born in sin. We're born by nature children of wrath at enmity with God without hope and without God in the world. But by faith, Enoch found restoration. He found reconciliation and he walked with God. We also know that God transformed Enoch's nature. Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, Enoch also had righteousness imputed to him by faith so that he was acceptable to God, pleased God, and walked with God. God is holy and righteous, and unless one is given by faith a righteousness not his own, he cannot walk with God. It also should be pointed out that we are to seek God himself. Right? We're to seek God himself, not just the rewards that he can give us. In fact, knowing and walking with the living God of the universe is our reward. Being with God, walking with God, is the grand reward. Psalm 73, 25 and 26. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. We also need to keep in mind that Enoch lived in a world that was quickly spiraling down uh, into judgment. God was about to send a worldwide flood to destroy the whole thing, except Noah and his family. Enoch, though, remained faithful. He was a faithful father and, and grandfather and great-grandfather. As we will talk about more next week, uh, Noah was Enoch's great-grandson. Noah was Enoch's great-grandson. Remember, Enoch, at the age of 65, named his son Methuselah, which was a type of prophecy about judgment coming, and Enoch continually walked faithfully with God for 300 years. What a legacy Noah's great-grandpa, Enoch, left behind. Genesis 6, verse 5 says, Yahweh saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And Yahweh regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So Yahweh said, I will blot out man, whom I created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of Yahweh. Then listen to what it says in the next verse, verse 9 in chapter 6. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generations. Noah walked with God. Noah walked with God. This is not a coincidence. Noah's great-grandpa, Enoch, also walked with God. 
Enoch had a huge impact on his future generations. It was his legacy that produced Noah and kept hope alive in an age of worldwide destruction. It really was Enoch and Noah against the world. At a time when Yahweh said, I will blot out man whom I've created from the face of the land, there was only one man and his family that still walked with God, and that man was Enoch's great-grandson. If it wasn't for Enoch's faith and his legacy passed down, none of us would be here today. None of us would be here today. We should all be thankful for Enoch. Enoch is also mentioned in the little New Testament book of Jude. Jude is warning about false teachers, and he has a lot to say about false teachers. Jude 4, or Jude 1, 4, says, For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Then verse 8, Yet in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. Verse 10, But these people blaspheme all they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's heir and perished in Korah's rebellion. These are hidden reefs at your love feasts as they feast with you without fear, shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted. Wild waves of the sea, casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. So he's really against these false teachers. It's really anti-false teachers. Then he brings up Enoch in verse 14. says, it was also about these, about these false teachers, false prophets, false teachers, It says, it was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. There's there's more uh, than what it says in Genesis. Kind of interesting. Enoch lived in a world of false teachers and false religion that was about to be drowned into hell. He lived in an ungodly world that rejected the God, rejected the God who rewards those who seek him and walks with those who by faith are granted his righteousness. He is shown here in Jude as a prophet, a prophet who was prophesying about the coming judgment ahead. He was a preacher of judgment in a world of false teachers. He uses the word ungodly there in four times. It's interesting because that quote from Enoch that Jude gives is not in Genesis. It's actually a quote from the book of Enoch. It wasn't, the book of Enoch was not an inspired book that belongs in the canon of scripture. There's some pretty crazy things in there. But apparently, this quote about Enoch is accurate, or Jude wouldn't have quoted it. The ungodliness that was flooding the pre-flood world that Enoch lived in gives us a better picture of the kind of faith and faithfulness that he had for 365 years. I don't know, really, if there's significance to that, that he, he lived a year of years, you know, 365 days a year for 365 years, but it's probably significant. It probably means something. Uh, may, maybe it's, I mean, it's interesting because he's seven, seven generations from Adam. And Adam, so seven is significant in the Bible. It's the day of rest. So we see uh, he, he starts to walk with God. The seventh generation finds rest and restored worship again. And then he lives for 365 days or years, a lot longer than 365 days. Uh, I don't know, there's, there's, it's interesting. So when Noah was preaching about judgment to come on the world, he was following in the 
steps of his great-grandpa, Enoch. Just think of being alive for 365 years. I mean, that's actually a small, that's a short life compared to all the other guys uh, of his time. But 365 years. Uh, if, if he was alive in our time and he died in 2023, that would mean that he was alive in the 1600s when the pilgrims were doing their thing. He would, have, he would have been born in 1658. He would have been alive during the American Revolution and when George Washington became president. He would have been around 200 years, he would have been about 200 years old at the time of the Civil War. And he would have still been alive when Trump and Joe Biden were presidents. He could have had an email address. Just think of the people you know that live faithfully for, you know, faithfully to God for 60, 70 years and, and the legacy that they leave behind. Enoch walked with God by faith 300 years after Methuselah was born. He walked with God, bypassing death right into eternity. Now, we don't know what, how that happened. We don't know if a chariot of fire came down like with Elijah. It just doesn't say. Uh, I, one of my theories is maybe he just, because they still, this is only, this is not too far after the, they were banned from the Garden of Eden. They lived east of Eden. Uh, maybe God took him right back into the Garden Paradise. Well, they just walked right back into, into uh, eternity that way, the presence of God. He was a preacher who preached an unpopular message that an ungodly world didn't want to hear. He was in the world, but not of it, and preaching a message of judgment against it. It was Enoch contramundum. It was Enoch against the world. Again, verse 6 in our text says, And without faith it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. It doesn't say that we can draw near to God when we think it's all about our existence and because we're good. We don't draw near to God because we've been good, little boys and girls. We draw near because we believe he exists and he is good. He rewards those who seek him. And I think we need to remember that when we sit down at the king's table today as well. Next week, we'll look at Noah, who followed in the footsteps of his great-grandpa, and who also walked with God, and who also prophesied about the coming judgment, and we'll tie it all into Father's Day. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Please stand. Let's pray together. Our gracious God and Father, everything that we have comes from you. You fill us with good things. Our hearts and lives overflow with your abundance. With gratitude, we bring to you our time, talents, and tithes. Use these gifts that you have given us to feed others as we have been fed, to serve others as we have been served, and to bless others as we have been blessed. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.